All right. Seems like everything's holding together for now. Um, let's hope it stays that way. Uh, okay, so hope I didn't lose anyone. Let's see. Still got some people here. Seems like we got a got a just a quorum. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. So I got your your case studies. Those look good. All right. Seems like the whole blackboard thing worked. Okay. Um, and I'll get those back to you just as soon as I can. Okay. Uh, I need to put up some review questions too. I think that would be helpful for you guys. Um, I'm gonna do that. All right. I've been kind of a busy week, uh, but I'm gonna do that. I'll just put up. I'll put up questions and answers, and then you can go and three see how that works. So it's gonna be kind of Romer related stuff. Okay. Um, it's. Yeah, I mean, so so it should be helpful for for thinking about the exam, okay. Um, and speaking of the exam, I'm trying to decide on the timing that we should do. I mean, I can basically either uh, have it so that it's just like within you know they are there's like an allotted time slot um, at 10 a.m. to 12, I believe. Uh, on Monday, okay, that's like the official time, which we would normally just do that. Um, <clears throat> and whatever the case may be, I'm gonna give you ex extra time because it just makes sense to, um, if, if only because you need to, to scan things and and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the question is, I, mean, I could give you I could give you more time, okay? So if I were to give you like the whole day, okay, that would allow you to, to schedule the exam like kind of when it's con convenient for you. Um, yeah, that, that, that could be an idea. Um, my only worry is that other pe people might have multiple exams on the same day and that could be complicated. All right. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, if you guys have opinions on that or if, if you have, uh, you know, what, if you have an idea of what your other classes are doing, um, and, and what your exam schedule looks like, uh, you know, that would be cool if you could let me know. So I'm going to, I'm going to figure that out today. Uh, probably later today, um, what what the exact timing is going to be. But the but in terms of what's going to be on the exam, it's going to be similar to the midterm in terms of structure, kind of the two question multi part uh, uh, problem solving situation, kind of free form answer. Okay, and uh, that, so that should be familiar. Okay, um, it's just that we're going to be looking at stuff relating to kind of the Romer model and the Jones. Uh, model uh, rather than solo per se. Um, yeah, so that would be the idea. Like you have, you know, maybe it's like you have three hours and you can start sometime during the day and send it to me when, when you're done. Okay, so that obviously relies on kind of the honor system there. Um, so I could do that or I could just sort of do it at the time, uh, put it up on Blackboard. Okay, so um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what your other lectures are doing. Oh, does it say Tuesday? I thought it, okay. Um, all day would be nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I mean, yeah. So I think that could be good. That that also alleviates issues of like it didn't get uploaded or something, or like some people can't access it. Some people can. All of a sudden, you're scrambling to to try and keep things basically fair. Okay. So um, doing an all day thing could be good. And I I mean, we could also just do all day. You could use as much as time as you want. Okay, so this kind of thing. I mean, at some point you run into decreasing returns on on time, right? You 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 you've done as much as you can, right? And in a lot of cases, that's that's quite a bit, you know. And then and then you finish up. So um, it, it might it might just be good to to give a, a big time window and have you guys do the the open notes kind of style exam. Okay. Um, Okay, so yeah, let yeah for my grad classes, I'm doing an all day kind of thing, so maybe I'll I'll do that for my for my undergrad for this undergrad class too. Okay, so um, and in that in that scenario, which which I guess is seeming likely, uh, in that scenario, maybe I post the exam at in the morning and then say you know get a B, get it to me by the night time. Okay, um, so yeah, I mean I could have posted it nine and then get it to be get it to me by like 11 59 
okay just the end of the the day the calendar day basically okay um and that should be enough time to 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 sit down and and, and give it a good run but yeah i mean if, if i do that like trying I, I don't want you to spend you know 16 hours on this thing okay this you know, uh you know it's, it's the kind of thing it's just so you can schedule it at when the right time is um and and do your best okay so i mean you have you can if you if you decide to spend 16 hours on it i guess you could but that's not the intention is for it to, to be done over the course of like two or two or three hours. Okay. Um, all right. So then, yeah, but then, of course in that case you would, you can't talk to each other. Okay. So just don't, I mean, that shouldn't be too hard. I think for, for, for most pairs of people. Um, so, you know, don't talk to each other during that day. Um, and that's, that's really all that we need. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll I'll send you a formal email outlining uh, my vision for the exam. Okay, uh, but that, that seems like that's that's how we'll do it. Okay, I'm just I'm just going to confer with some of the other econ people today. Okay, um, now um, so you're saying exam is scheduled for Tuesday. Let me let me let me double check this here. Okay, so where where the Monday to Final exam. I'm seeing. Let me. I'll just show you what I'm seeing. So this is the uh, spring term. That's us, 2020. Um, so I'm seeing. So so our class day is Monday, the 10 a.m. We're 10:30, but we're in the 10 a.m. slot basically. And so this is saying the final day would be Monday, April 20th, 10 a.m. Basically, the, the official allotted slot would be 10 a.m. to 12. Okay, so um, that's what I'm seeing. If that seems, I, I sometimes get confused by these things, but if that, yeah, if that seems not correct, let me know now. Um, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing our class is, that is, that is a good point. I'm thinking about grad class. Our class is 1.30. There, see, that's why I have you guys around to let me know what I've just totally lost it. Um, okay, so then... Uh, 1 p.m. Tuesday, that's okay. It's not, okay, so then it's, yeah, okay. You were correct. Uh, uh, April 21st, that's a Tuesday. Um, so it's same time, 10 a.m. Okay, so, okay, that's that's actually better for me. Okay, because then I have a grad exam on Monday. Okay, so then uh, Tuesday is the day, April 21st, um, and 10 a.m. Okay, but but the, the actual time will be, will be sort of longer than that. Okay, if you want to do it 10 to 12, you can do it. You'll definitely be able to do that, uh, but I'll, I'll have the exam out for longer than that, so you can shift it around to your to your leisure. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So then, cool. I'm glad we got that sorted out. Now, thanks to you guys, I know what day it is. That's important. Um, and uh, we'll yeah, we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Um, all right. So I think that's it for for kind of exam. Um, and, and we'll get look at the final word soon. All right. Uh, now, uh, what else is there to say? I think um, I don't have too much other stuff that I wanted to go into. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, so let's leave it at that. Uh, okay. So then, I guess to to today, I had sort of a you know kind of a final lecture uh, that I wanted to do. From the causes of growth. Okay, this is a little bit more empirical than theoretical, um, and yeah, I mean it's not. It's relevant to. It's not going to really be like stuff that's on the exam. Okay, the exam is going to be more like kind of model solving and things like that. Um, but it's kind. Of, I mean, it's relevant, right? If you want to make inferences, even when you're thinking theoretically. Okay, um, thinking about the causes of growth carefully uh, is important. Okay, um, so so this in some sense is like a more general. Um, this is a more general discussion of things that we've been touching upon. Okay, because in when we were doing the Roman model and in, in lecture four endogenous growth, you know, we had we we had certain like findings. Okay, you know, we found that. The, the growth rate sort of in the long run really is just going to be a function of kind of 
population growth rate and what that research production function looks like. But it's not going to be a function of uh, the research share directly. Okay. But we also saw that the research share will influence like the level of um, uh, output. Okay. So, so, I mean, it is true that if you see a country, you know, if a country changed their research share, they would see more growth in the future. Okay. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a prediction in the data. And so it's, you know, it's something you could think about looking at in the data. Okay. And the countries by and large don't change their research shares that quickly. Okay. So it's a little bit hard to do that. Okay. Um, but there is some variation. Okay. Um, the other problem is that research really is an international endeavor. Okay. So if one country changes their research share, um, those ideas that they may produce are probably going to have an impact, not just on themselves, but on the whole world. Okay. So in some, in some sense, we only have one data point, which is the world, if it's connected enough. And that makes statistical inference rather difficult. Okay. So, um, and you know, I mean, you have time, the time dimension. Okay. You can look at the world over time, uh, but there's so many different things that happen in the world that it's hard to isolate particular things when you have things look, when you're looking at things over time and across countries, then you know, different countries do different things. And so you get more statistical power there when you're looking at the whole world and, and as a unit, then you lose statistical power. Okay. Um, yeah, so that makes things difficult. Okay. But you know, in other cases, there are policies that would influence the growth, the growth of a country more in isolation. Okay. So something like that in fact, the investment rate um, for, for like a standard solo tile cap, capital thing, that's more, you know, there's, there are fewer spillovers and externalities. It's like a country, you know, invests in infrastructure for themselves and that kind of helps them mostly, right? Um, and so there you can look at individual countries and get some more statistical power back, right? Uh, so you can look at policies and, and stuff like that, and institutions, political or otherwise, okay? Um, and so that, that's kind of what we're going to focus on. And that's that's this causes of growth lecture. Okay, um, so now let's see. Let's go over lecture. That gets rid of the blue link at the top. Um, okay, so this is the causes of economic growth lecture five. Um, okay, so uh, es essentially what we're going to do is keep working down that chain that we started with um, on solo. Okay, so with solo we were like, well. We have some output, okay, and the question is what causes output to change over time? Um, and the answer there, I mean, the assumption really, is that output changes because of either changes in population, changes in the level of capital, uh, relatively speaking, or the changes in something else, which we attribute, which we kind of then bin into some unknown called total factor productivity or technology, okay? So we, we kind of, but really what we do is we say, okay, well, let's, let's, divide by, let's take out population, that's pretty easy. You know, you just divide by population and turn everything into per capita numbers. Then you're like, okay, well now there's there could be more capital per capita, capital per worker. Um, let's factor that out in a way that's informed by that production function. Okay, so we're gonna, gonna assume the production function and that lets us sort of factor out the capital components. So right now we're saying, okay, this country grew, they also invest in capital. Do we expect them to grow? But did they grow kind of more than we expect? If they grow more than we expect, then we're attributing that stuff to like this Z factor, okay? Which is which is could be technology, um, but it could be efficiency, right? It could just be the efficiency with which you use units. If, if you just throw stuff out, burn it, that's going to re result in a reduction in Z, okay? So um, it, it's a combination of potentially many different things, okay? Um, but, but that, and so that's why it's some kind of sometimes called the solo residual. It's a residual. It's just what's left over. Okay. It's what we can't explain. Um, okay. So that <clears throat> the assumption was that kind of, we can do that. Right. Um, and, and then you look, you can look at particular countries, which you guys did. Right. And you see different stories for different countries. Sometimes you see countries that their growth is largely capital driven and there's not, much change in TFP. And sometimes you see countries where it's like some capital driven growth, but also a lot of changes in TFP. All right. So, and that's going to vary from country to country. That's going to vary within country from time period to time period. All right. So, um, 
but then at some point you have to sit, you have to ask yourself, why did Z change? All right. Why, why is it that that happened? Okay. And Romer provides at least a way to think about that, like an explanation for why Z changes, which is that people do research. Okay. Um, and it provides an explanation, but also like it, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it maps through exactly what the incentives are for research, okay? Um, and allows you to consider different types of policies in, in detail, okay? So not just sort of like assuming that you should do a certain amount of research, but actually endogenizing that and saying, how much do we think re research people would be doing, okay? So um, so that goes down that road a little bit of, of thinking about technology. Um, but even then, you know, not everything is technology, okay? Sometimes it's, it's actual uh, you know, think changes in policy and market structure, uh, how competitive industries are and things like that. So all of that um, is going to affect Z as well. Essentially like the efficiency of, of the allocation of goods. Okay, so that, that, can, vary from, that can vary from country to country, right? Um, especially if you think about like capital investment, different <clears throat> firms or governments do capital investment, okay, and that's kind of determined by, like, finance, okay. It's determined by um, who who can get access to financial capital, financial you know, funding, basically, um, and hence buy, invest in capital, okay. Um, and the the financial system can be more or less efficient, can be more or less well developed. Okay, and that's, you know, financial development is something that happens in countries as they become more um, kind of technologically advanced uh, or wealthier uh, or industrialized and things like that. Um, you usually see financial development happening um, there. Okay, and, and that's that. That's where you, with that, with, with things like financial development and, and political development, then you start getting into really thorny issues of, of causality. OK, because you don't know what causes what it could be that you, know, you see countries, they industrialize and then they also develop financially in the sense of they get like formal banking and uh, security systems um, and uh, consumers or firms have more access to, to credit and borrowing, get better ability to sort of track how things are going in terms of accounting standards, um, you know. It could be that that happened and that allowed for industrialization because all of a sudden people could could reliably invest in, in stuff. Um, or it could be that the possibility of industrialization spurred the financial development because if you want to do, if you want to buy a big, do a big capital investment, build a factory, you need finance. Um, and then so it's a question of was it the supply that changed or the demand that changed or was it both? Okay. Um, that's Those are the, causal, the types of causality issues we're going to be thinking about okay and you can tell a similar story for the political side okay so um so so then once you once you go down that road then you need to um you start needing to you need a way to think about causality all right and this is it's like kind of you know it's just it's, just, it's sort of statistics and econometrics uh tools that we're talking about here okay but you need a way to think about causality um the, okay, so if it was a practice, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna post their uh, they're gonna be review questions. You can think of it's basically gonna look like a practice midterm or sorry, a practice final as well. I'm gonna post that like yeah, I got I'm gonna post the the questions and solutions for that. Okay, so I'm gonna do that realistically tonight. Okay, um, I have some questions that I, from from before that I can that I can use. I just need to uh, make sure that they're still kind of using the, the same notation that we are in, and the, the solutions are up to up to snuff okay so that that'll happen that'll happen tonight okay um all right so then uh now let's let's so let's, let's you know if we want to go through this okay in terms of this the slides all right so this is you you can when i was talking about Solo stuff. Okay, I, I, I forgot to mention human capital. That's important too. Um, but with the solo stuff, you know, essentially that that decomposition that I was talking about. That you know, you can express that uh, either in terms of this production function, 
okay, this is, an, this is an assumption, but you can express it in terms of this production function, which then leads to, if you kind of take the growth rate of this whole equation here, you get this, this growth rate equation. Um, and, and so this is that decomposition, right, where you're looking at changes in, in output and seeing how much is coming from capital, how much is coming from human capital potentially, and then what's left over from technology or other, okay? So this is this is that solo decomposition, and this these are these are what I call proximate causes. They're things that you can see that sort of immediately predated and are related potentially to changes in output. Okay, but we don't know why necessarily these happened. And we also know that there is there will potentially be causal linkages between even between these things. the The main one that we talk about is that. You know, if there's a change in technology, that's immediately going to increase output, but it's also going to induce an increase in capital investment, which will then have some follow-on effect later on. Okay, so so even there, like between these things, there are causal linkages. Okay, so if you just see capital changing, okay, you don't really know if that's because of some systematic change in the investment rate or if it was because of a change in technology or both. Okay, so um. And you can you can you know there's a Jones trick to get around it uh, by by looking at the ratio of capital output, um, but but that requires the assumptions basically, and and that's um, yeah it requires. I mean it's it's not it's not sort of a surefire thing, okay. Um, all right, so this doesn't look great. I got to do the zoom trick. There we go. Okay, so. Um, yeah, and this is what I was, this is actually, this is that that Jones trick, okay, where you kind of swap things around and, and, and look at this ratio of capital to output, okay, which which is going to be kind of constant in a solo setting, okay? So you can try and account for that, okay? But, you know, it could be that other things happen. It could be that an increase in productivity also spurs an increase in, in the investment in human capital for various reasons, okay? Uh, the, the internet or something like that, okay? So so there's all sorts of ways that these things could be linked that we don't, we can't always come up with a way to account for them, all right? Um, okay, so then that's why we're gonna look for, instead of just proximate causes, we're gonna try and think a little bit more about fundamental causes, okay? Now, um, there's, there's a whole kind of vocabulary that's been developed, it's a you know, system of terminology that's been developed to, to think about these types of more fundamental causes, okay? Um, so I think, I mean, there's a one kind of dichotomy that people have created is, is between this institutions and culture. And it's a little fuzzy, actually, like, if you think about it too hard. Sometimes it breaks down, okay? Um, but essentially, um, it's it's kind of like a formal, well, yeah, I mean, so so institutions are, are rules governing interactions between people, okay? So you can think about very formal types of institutions like political systems, like the Constitution of the United States that sort of delineates how things should be done, but not always, um, and you know, so, I mean, it, it delineates how elections basically should happen and stuff like that, like electoral college and so on. And that's generally how it goes down, right? So um, you can you can think about that, okay, and that's going to have, you know, that will determine political outcomes, it'll determine economic outcomes partially. Um, and so, so those are considered institutions, okay? You can think about <clears throat> more economic institutions in terms of, what is the nature of antitrust law, for instance, in the U.S.? You know, so for you know, you have to certain mergers need to be approved by the uh, I guess FTC. Um, you know, so you know, if you think of it, I think two of the major internet companies, it's like Comcast and someone someone merged. It wasn't Verizon and Com might have been Verizon and Comcast. There's some big merger, but you know, you got to get this stuff approved, okay? Um, and so, like, how that happens is a thing, right? And obviously, there were big changes in antitrust law um, in the, the, you know, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. They're clearly going to have had effects, okay? Um, so, 
lately it's been pretty stable. Okay, but you know those types of things. Okay, how markets work, the legal structure, tort. Can you be sued for selling a defective product? All these sorts of things are going to determine outcomes, and they're 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 basically kind of legal, formal institutions. Okay, um, but then you can kind of go down the ladder towards less formal institutions. Okay, um, and so this this would be more like tipping. That would be a a less formal institution. That's like that's like a social norm, basically. Um, and the idea there is that you know it's not a rule, right? You're not gonna be fined for not tipping, right? You're not going to be legally uh, uh, sanctioned for not tipping, okay? But you might be sanctioned for not tipping in certain ways, informally, right? Uh, non non legal sanctions. Um, so those are more like social norms, okay? So you know you're expected to do it according to some percentage, right? And if you don't do it, you might feel bad. People might not like you. They might sanction. They might be. They might. They might be less willing to cooperate with you or be nice to you in the future. Uh, something like that. Okay. Either your friends, other people that know you, or or the actual person that was not tipped. Right. So, um, <clears throat> that's like a social norm because it's enforced by kind of the threat of punishment if you don't conform to the social norm. Okay. Um, and so that that could be classed into an institution as well. Okay. Um, and yeah. So then, so that though, but those are all gov those are all relating to how like rules for how people interact. Okay, there aren't. If you're just sitting alone, I mean, we're not thinking about institutions there. You're really not doing anything anyway. So, um, and then culture is more like preferences. Okay, uh, so here it's like you know, kind of like religious stuff. Okay. Um, and obviously religious stuff relates, you know, that relates to institutions. So, um, it's a good, I don't know. A good, I mean, if you think about, uh, there are various in the economic realm, especially there are various religions that are sort of more in, you know, that are, that are not super cool with, uh, charging interest on loans. Okay. So that actually directly kind of constrains how people can interact financially. Um, so uh, this, you know, this whole Islamic banking thing that's 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 pretty big nowadays. So um, you know, that, that's the thing where it, the religious stuff is actually institutional and and and, and so on. Um, but if you think about sort of uh, preferences or just like what do people like? Do they, you know, do they like drinking wine or do they like drinking beer? You know, I mean, like um, just this things like that that are more internal. Okay, they're still persistent, and obviously, culture is a social thing. Right. It's not it's not. But but it's also sort of can you can think about it as a property. It's something that determines people's preferences and this is a property of a person. Um, OK, so these these this is one dichotomy that people have entertained. OK. Um, and, and so you can try and you can try and think about this and, and attribute causes and think about like, do you know, would a certain type of institution or certain type of culture lead to different outcomes. OK. Now, it's really difficult, though, because um, for a variety of reasons. One is, I mean, it's not, how do you even measure this stuff? I mean, it's it's very difficult uh, to measure. If you think about religion, you know, different you know, people, different countries, may, they may have official religions or they may have a predominant religion, but they also have wildly different ways in which they sort of interpret that and practice it and how sort of seriously they take it. Um, so, so measuring that stuff can be difficult. Like there's these, the Pew surveys, they look at international, attitudes okay that, that stuff is pretty good i mean you, you ask how often do you go to church you know like what do you what yes i think they ask people about their belief in some kind of god so you can you can try and figure that out and get sort of survey results okay but it's still a little bit um it's not not a price okay it's not like the profitability of a company it's not that numeric okay but it's still pretty good um <clears throat> institutions you know I mean, those those can be a little bit better, right? You think about like something like uh, innovation policy, the length of a patent. That's a number, okay? You can compare that across countries, uh, but at the same time, there's still many differences for how, what what is the def what is the standard you meet, need to meet to get a patent in different countries. That differs. Does it um, just need to be not obvious and useful, like in the U.S.? 
uh, or do you have to have a working prototype? Okay, that's in China, there's a class of patents where you have to have a basically a working prototype, which I think would be good probably here. I think there's a lot of people that just patent stuff that they think would be a cool idea and they don't actually know how to do. Um, so there's different standards there that, and it's, so it's not just the length, it's also sort of like this, the, the patenting standard. Okay, so there's so many details to different institutions that it's hard to compare them or to say that the, the space of policies is very high dimensional. Okay, so um, that's also difficult. Okay, so, um, but you could try. There's no reason not to try, all right? Um, and, and you can try and quantify these things as best as you can, all right? And then and then see how that influences different outcomes, okay? You can see how it influences economic growth. You can see how it influences uh, income, you know, not just growth, but the level of, of income per capita after a certain period of time, okay? And so you can ask stuff about the magnitude of the effect. You can say like how much like you, you, you kind of want to know once you get these different numbers for Z for te for for solar residual. Like some of it's probably technology, but some of it might come from uh, institutional factors. Okay, so you kind of want to know what's going on there. All right. Now, um, causation is important. All right. So let's let's think about causation here because uh, it's also true that institutions can be endogenous, right? Institutions like laws and political structures are influenced by the economic realm and the cultural and social realm, okay? Uh, so, you know, if you see a certain political institution associated with economic growth, like democracy, for instance, well, that institution may have arisen or been per more persistent because of economic factors, okay? Um, so we'll talk about that in more detail in a second, all right? But essentially, in the more general sense, um, we, we wanna do this inference problem. Okay, so here, this is like the abstract. Okay, we're gonna get more specific about what these things are, okay, uh, in a second, all right? Um, what's going on here? My tablet is backwards. I think I can fix that though. Okay, my tablet's not backwards. Okay, so uh, essentially what's happening here is, um, okay, we have we have cause and effect. Those are the thing. this is the thing we wanna know. We wanna know like, you know, for instance, what's the effect of, of, of a Democrat, democratic governance on economic uh, gr outcomes in terms of income per capita? That's a question you could ask. Okay, so um, now uh, there's a bunch of different possibilities, but the, the, so the, so, but essentially these arrows are like indicating causation potentially. Okay, so this is saying, here's some causal factor. You know, the arrow may, the question marks mean maybe. Okay, so it's like, there could be a causal, a direct causal impact of democracy on income per capita, the effect, okay? And then the dashed lines are also kind of maybes, okay? There also could be other factors, confounding factors, um, like, you know, geography, uh, natural resources, uh, your neighbors, who, who, what neighbors, neighboring countries you have and what governance and economic systems they have uh, that could influence both the cause factor, which is political and the effect of the economic. Okay. So, um, and if that was the case, if you, if you just looked at these two in isolation and looked and said, oh, hey, look, democracies have better economic outcomes you would not be able to make that jump and say, democ because they are democracies, they have better outcomes, okay? This is the, the restatement of the old saw that correlation does not equal causation that I'm sure you guys have heard many times before, right? So um, this is a more, the, the whole framework here, this, this, these arrows and bubbles, this is called, these are like causal graphs, okay? They're causal, they're graphs, not in the sense of you're graphing a function like, x squared or whatever, but graphs in the sense of a network, okay, uh, where you have different nodes here and you have different linkages, directed linkages between them that indicate causality, okay? So that, that that's why we're calling these causal graphs, okay? So they're just, I don't know, remember why they call a network a graph, but that's what they call it in like network theory, okay? Um, sometimes this is called a directed acyclic graph, okay, or a DAG, uh, because these the, the directedness means that it th these two things like might be connected and they are connected in a particular direction okay so it's not just like 
we're friends. It's like, I'm friends with you and you're friends with me. Okay. Or maybe I'm friends with you and you're not friends with me. I don't know, you know, but it, there, there's a notion of directedness, which could be important. Okay. Um, or if you think about a supply chain, you know, I supply goods to this other firm and they supply to some other firm who sell to the consumer. That's a directed network. Okay. And then the acyclic part, acyclic part uh, means that there isn't a cycle. There's not a, th there's not a route where you can follow the arrows and go in a circle and end up back where you started. Okay. That might not always be true, actually. Like with the, with the supply chain, it, it, might, it might be cyclic. You know, Ford makes cars that they sell to someone else that makes something that Ford buys that they used to make cars and you know, it's, it's all, it's all the circle of life, you know? So, um, but, and it, it, even in the causal causality realm where you have different factors that are potentially causing each other, you might have a sort of co-determination dynamic. Okay. So we'll talk about that, but that's, that's the causal graph notion. Causal graphs are good because they force you to formally think about what the hell you're talking about. Okay. Uh, it's kind of similar to how, use math. You can use math to, to be precise and, and formalize what you're saying. You can also use it to sort of hide what you're really saying. Um, I think this causal graph stuff does a lot of the former and not too much of the latter. So that's good. Um, all right. So then let's think about that. That's more specific example. Okay. So we're thinking about the uh, relationship between political stability specifically. Okay. So I was saying democracy, but let's just say it's stability. Okay. So maybe you're um, a uh, very vibrant democracy like Taiwan or something, um, or maybe you're more like a Singapore, or a little bit, but more on the autocratic side, but not too much. Um, or maybe you're just not democratic. Okay, but 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 the stability factor could be uh, could be important. Okay, just sort of predictability. You know that you're, there's not going to be some big revolution, and you're gonna, you know, lose all your whatever you had. Or maybe, you know, uh, maybe you're a business owner and you had a factory and you're going to, it's going to get expropriated or something like that. Okay. So, um, you'd think there's going to be some relationship between political stability and economic growth, but also other stuff. Okay. So, so the, we're going to go through different options. I'm not saying this is the way the world works all the time. I'm just saying these are, let's think about what we could possibly conclude. Okay. Um, so one, one thing that could be true is that there's just there simply is direct causality. Okay. Sometimes things are not as complicated as we fear that they are. Okay. Sometimes it's just direct, you know, uh, A causes B. All right. So, um, so it could be, you know, that having political stability, uh, means that different actors can predict the future more reliably and hence make decisions about investment or, in, you know, physical capital investment, human capital investment, and so on, uh, career choice and everything like that. Um, and and they can do that in such a way that's more beneficial for themselves and, and society at large. Okay. Um, that could be a thing. Probably is a thing. All right. Okay. Now there's the so-called reverse causality. Okay. So the reverse causality, I mean, like, question is reverse from whose perspective? It's reverse from kind of the naive, what you would, the, the direct causal um uh, notion that you might have. Okay. So here reverse causality would be that economic growth actually leads to political stability. And, uh, so here, you know, you have, if you have a prosperous country, they can pay their, um, well, just their legislators more, they can pay their, their civil servants more and things like that. Um, and people are generally kind of happy. Okay. And they may not, be prone to revolutions, either violent or nonviolent, uh, because they're okay with the current situation. Okay. Um, I think that's, I mean, this, this is a dynamic everywhere. You hear it more, you, you hear it talked about more often in the context of a uh, more autocratic countries like China, where it's sort of this grand bargain of, okay, we're going to provide economics, uh, growth, which largely have, I think for most people, uh, and in, in return, like you're not going to complain too much. Okay. That's, that's the grand bargain, um, that, that people see in China. Um, but I think also implicitly that it, that's probably true everywhere. I mean, people, the economy is doing terribly. Eventually people are not going to be happy. Okay. 
um, in a democracy, they have a safety relief valve, which is elections. Um, and so maybe that's 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 a more stable way to adjudicate that process. Okay, so um, but it, but in general, you wouldn't be surprised if there was a direct, also uh, effective economic growth on political stability. Okay, um, so that's the reverse causality story in this from this particular perspective that we had taken. Okay, um, and now the thing about that is, okay, so with the direct causality, if you if you looked at the correlation between these two things, you would see a positive correlation. With reverse causality, if you looked at the correlation between these two things, you would see a positive correlation. Potent so you have no, observationally, you basically cannot distinguish these two scenarios, right? That's a problem because you can't, you can't determine the true nature of the world from this data, okay? Um, okay, so that's, that's like problem number one, okay? There's even more problems though, okay? There, there's, more out there's more possible outcomes, okay? There, there's, there's many possible outcomes. Um, so the third major class of sort of uh, true natures of the world that could we could could actually be the case uh, in this setting would be something like third cause or confounding factor scenario. Okay, so here um, you have some other factor which we're going to just introduce and say in this case let's say it's social trust. Okay, um, and that can potentially influence both economic growth. And political stability. Okay, so social trust is. I mean, it's it's the combination of those two words. I mean, it's it's. Uh, you know, it could it could be relevant for business for like finance. If you loan someone money, do you kind of think that they're going to be a reasonable person? Like tipping, do you do you think someone's going to tip? Okay, and and uh, hence, are you going to like give them good service? Um, you know, there's all sorts of. Uh, ways in in which social trust can be important, it, and it's it's, but it's it's inside people's head. I mean, heads. It's, it's a, a social factor, but it's definitely something that varies from country to country, okay, and from time to time, all right, from place to place, okay. So, um, let let's just say that that's a it's a it's a thing that could be out there, all right, and and you might expect in situate in countries or situations where you have high social trust. You would have potentially high economic growth and uh, political stability. Okay, so with economic growth, it's like sort of the finance angle. Like people are just like they're more willing to take risks and and rely on other people. Okay, uh, their supplier is going to actually deliver the goods rather than go bankrupt and so on. Okay, um, and then on the political stability side, I mean, it's like you know, pol politics is a delegation game. I mean, you you delegate for a certain period of time. Uh, you delegate. The authority to rule to a set of people or a person, right? So um, the level of trust could be important there, okay? And then it's like you might have, if you, social trust is also kind of, you have different factions in a society and how, how do they get along, like a polarization, which is a big thing now. Um, so there, you know, that obviously also would, would influence political stability, okay? With like either within democratic system or thinking about going from democratic to non-democratic systems and things like that, okay? So, um, so you could imagine that being another thing, all right? And that would be a confounding factor, and it would still be the case, even in this third option, that if you looked at the correlation between political stability and economic growth, assuming that story I just told was true, it would be positive, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, I'm saying positive correlation here. You, you could have negative correlations too, okay? It could be that, I mean, it'd be kind of weird, but it could be that social trust is bad for economic growth for some reason. That people trust each other too much and they get comfortable and they're not competitive. I don't know. It's it's a little bit of a weird story, but there is examples you could give of negative correlations. But it's the same idea is that if you see this negative correlation, you can't you can't distinguish is it scenario one direct, is it scenario two reverse, is it scenario three indirect confounding factor. Um, whatever, whether the correlation is positive or negative, you always have this problem of inference. You can't figure out what state you actually are in. Okay. Um, okay. And then there's, there's some other more exotic scenarios. The one, two, three that I just gave you, direct reverse confounding are the main ones. Okay. Now you, you can also think that there are others. Okay. Um, so the, the, this one is the mutual feedback. This is where you get into that cyclic thing. So here you can see there's a cycle. 
you go from political stability, which causes growth, which causes political stability, and so on. That's a cycle, all right? Um, it's, a, it's just a back and forth cycle, but it's a cycle, all right? So um, yeah, uh, so here, this is the combination of the direct and the, and the reverse story at the same time, okay? They were both plausible, and this, this might be a plausible uh, uh, scenario, okay? So here, you know, they're, they're both kind of influencing each other. Now, now, when you get into these sort of feedbacks, okay, inevitably you have you think about a sort of intertemporal dimension, which is that you know, political stability today or expected political stability in the future causes economic growth as it happens in the future or into the future. And then economic growth today will sort of lead to political stability and stability is a notion that happens over time, okay? It's like the, the lack of volatility. Um, so, so there's an inherent intertemporal notion here, um, and that's and the, these cyclic feedbacks, okay, are, are manifest there, okay. So then the idea is like, if for some reason you say, I mean, like, knock on wood, uh, you know, in the, US, in the U.S. or the whole world, you have a pandemic, which is obviously reducing economic growth. That's probably going to lead to political instability in a lot of places, you know. So um, that's a thing. Um, and so once you have that, then if you lose political stability, you might lose more economic growth, and all of a sudden you get these feedbacks that, that kind of worked for a while and then stop working, okay? So it, it might create complex dynamics too, okay? Uh, but in terms of what you observe, you'll probably observe a positive correlation between these things, right? Because you know, if you have political stability, you have growth, which keeps stability in place and so on. But then if you lose that, then you lose both, okay? So, so, so even here in this fourth option, which is, which is more exotic, but maybe more plausible and realistic, you, you, you would still see the same thing that you would see for the previous three. So we, we now have many different stories, all of which generate the same observable outcome, which for inference, statistical inference is bad. Okay. Now, no, the last one is just the combination of every single story told thus far. Okay. Uh, what do they call it? What the most ambitious crossover since whatever, whatever. Um, so this is uh, where everything just causing everything else. And here you can see this is cyclic. Um, it's there's a cycle here, there's a cycle here, cycle here. There's a cycle where you go around the block. Okay, so there's all sorts of cycles here. Um, and so here, you know, this is also saying okay, you know, social trust is also a thing that's determined by other factors. Um, I think maybe economic growth to social trust is a pretty interesting dimension because you see when economic growth slows down, you get scapegoating, especially along uh, ethnic lines, right? So that, that's an example of uh, social trust, you know, being influenced by economic growth. Okay, so you can, you, you can often tell the reverse causality story, and here I'm telling all of the stories at once, okay? Um, yeah, so that's difficult, all right? It makes things very difficult, is what I'm saying. Okay, um, all right, so then let's, I've, I've now built up this, this sort of intractable problem. The question is, can we actually solve this? Okay, can we be clever and actually solve this? Um, yeah, sometimes, all right, there are methods, okay? Um, and and the, the essential idea is we wanna get back to sort of something more like the scientific method or a scientific experiment, okay? Or as much as we can. We can never truly get there in this kind of setting because we can't experiment on the world Okay, uh, either because it's technologically or practically infeasible or because it's unethical. Um, and so uh, we need to be a little bit more clever, right? So, uh, but, but the basic idea, if you think about what is a scientific exper experiment in this uh, causal graph language, okay? Uh, well, it's basically saying we wanna know the influence of X on Y, okay? We create an isolated system that has no other influences, you know, we put it on a, a shock absorbing, you know, platform and, you know, sound absorbing room, whatever, turn off the lights. Um, and we want to know what, what, how does X influence Y, you know, the classic Arrhenius experiment would be like, how does the, the concentration of CO2 in a box influence this equilibrium temperature when it's exposed to a light source, um, which is the, you know, the kind of the simple intuition for global warming. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, you, the scientist, you, you 
do an intervention. You say, okay, we're going to change the level of CO2 and then see what happens to the equilibrium temperature. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's, that's how you would think about an experiment in this context. And the important thing, the important features are the intervention influences X. Okay, so you change that CO2 concentration in the box. It doesn't influence Y. You don't like accidentally make the light brighter. You don't accidentally just change the temperature of the room in the process of doing this. And that's just being careful, basically. Um, so you don't accidentally just directly influence the thing you were trying to measure. That would be bad. Um, and also there's no arrows coming in from the outside. There's no other stuff that's like affecting both of these. Okay. So, so those are the critical things is an isolated and controlled experiment. Okay. And that's how you can think about this. And if you do it right, you can see, okay, I changed X and here's how much Y changed. That's your answer. And that's a direct causal statement. Okay. Uh, maybe you repeat it a couple times just to be sure. Okay. Now we can't do that. All right. That's this. It's a, you, know, you, you know we have we have pit we have the experimental lab they do that I shouldn't I shouldn't like say we can never do that that definitely experimental economics is a really big important thing and and I'd say not I'm not speaking for myself because I'm not an experimentalist but Pitt's pretty darn good at it okay so um, and and I don't know you guys I assume probably taken part in experiments I I was I was I did experiments when I was an undergrad. I thought it was pretty cool. I even made a little bit of money one time. Um, so yeah, you can definitely do experiments, but we're in macro here. So it's a little bit harder, okay? So then what What are we gonna do if we're at the macro scale and we can't do experiments? Um, well, uh, we can work on that. There's two things. There used to be a guy named John Duffy that was here. Sadly, he left for, for sunnier locales in California, I believe. Um, he did macro experimental. So he would just do experiments with like a bunch of people and see what happens. Okay. So that's one option. And now the question is when you go from a hundred people in an experiment to, you know, 350 million people in a country, do your dynamics change considerably? Very possible. Okay. So, um, but yeah, so, so let's just say we're going to try and do this. We're not going to do it a direct experimental approach, but we're going to try and do something else. All right. Um, and that other thing is sometimes called a natural experiment, okay? It's when something happens in the past and you think from that you can kind of infer something, okay? So, it, so it's essentially some potential accident or historical occurrence happens um, that you think for various reasons will influence your X variable, the thing you want to understand, the, the causal variable that you want to understand, and then uh, why the... The, the outcome variable that you want to look at, okay? Um, so, so now the question is, is that the case? Is it the case that this historical factor um, only influenced X but didn't influence Y, okay? So you can think of um, historical occurrences, okay, um, that might, you know, think about like, I mean, I guess the pandemic is one big thing, right? But that influences everything, right? Uh, it influences the economic realm, but it also influences the political realm because you might say, I don't know, maybe people aren't happy with their response and they're unhappy with their elected leaders, right? So um, that's going to be something that would influence many things. It might not be a good uh, historical factor to pick up. Um, you know, more of like a, just a random natural disaster, an earthquake, something like that. Uh, uh, could be, you know, maybe that, that influences the economic realm and not so much the political because it was just a thing that happened and it was terrible, but there was nothing we could do. Okay, so, um, you know, you, maybe maybe that's a plausible thing is looking at that, that kind of exogenous natural disaster. Um, but you can look at other stuff, like uh, you can look at election outcomes that are sort of surprises or things like that. And so you see a change in the political situation that might be exogenous, okay? But the idea is you want you want the 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 factor to be to determine your x variable, but be exogenous, hence not that is to say not determine or influence your y variable, okay? So that this this thing sometimes is called an instrument, okay? This this historical factor sometimes is called an instrument that it influences x but not y. That's the main assumption, and and more generally, it doesn't influence other stuff that it influences y. So there's no path from this thing to Y, but there is a path from this thing to X. Okay, so um, 
essentially this this the, the, a valid instrument or a valid historical factor here we define it in terms of this causal graph to look like a scientific experiment in this causal graph language okay um after that it just comes to arguing about whether that that is is this indeed a dotted line or is there indeed no line between factor this factor and, and y okay all right so um there's a bunch of examples of this. I mean, this is a big thing in economics, using instrumental variables to determine causality. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've seen it in your classes. Maybe you've seen it more in micro. It's kind of more of a micro thing, but it's also used in macro um, in development, especially. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's pretty important. Okay. Definitely not like a niche thing. It's like a really important thing. Okay. Um, so, and it's something, it's something that's not just useful for purely academic research. Okay. I mean, anytime you want to determine the cause of something, okay, it's going to be useful. Okay. So like my friend, my old college roommate works at um, a company, backcountry.com. They sell sporting equipment, I think. Uh, so they wanted to know like, what's the cause? You, you, they call up their customers sometimes, their best customers to say like, hey, how you doing? Like anything we can get you. Um, and uh, they want to know like what's the effect of doing that right now. I mean, yeah, if you look at, if you just look at whether you called them and whether they buy more stuff, like they're your best customers. Yeah. They're going to buy more stuff. Okay. Um, so, so there's issues of causality. Okay. So, so you want to like randomize, you want to like randomly call some people that weren't your best customers also and see, how do they respond and so on. So um, and this is something thinking about causality is it's important in any, uh, in a business setting in a political setting in, um, uh, or an academic setting. Okay. So uh, it's generally useful. Okay. So, so let's talk about one particular, okay, we got about 10 minutes here. Uh, we're going to talk about one particular um, uh, historical instrument or natural experiment that people have used. So you remember I said we can't do, um, experiments at the macro scale because it's unethical. Well, it's, it's still unethical, but it turns out people have done it in the past. Um, and you can think about colonialism like that. So, I mean, obviously they did it for a reason, but it's like also you were making huge changes to countries kind of externally. Okay. Um, and, and this had certain outcomes. And the question is, can, can anything be gleaned from this, from these changes? Okay, because you're changing political systems a lot, okay? Um, now, you know, the problem is colonialism wasn't a random process, you know? They went to particular countries because they had probably, because they had resources that they wanted, right? So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not obvious that you can just say, oh, this, this political change was induced by colonialism and we're going to look at the effect because the political change may have been induced it be been induced for economic reasons or because of economic factors and so you know it's not clear that you can you can draw that line okay so so you need to be but you can still you can still try and you, you just need to be more careful all right and so so one thing that you can do so there's this uh okay so there's this guy uh Duran Ajimoglu, um at MIT, so he, he has this book with, with James Robinson uh, called Why Nations Fail, okay, and they have, they talk about this stuff a lot, um, it's a decent book, okay, and uh, when it, kind of the, one of the marquee, you know, natural experiments that they look at is what's called the silo mortality instrument, okay, um, and so there, uh, what, what they do is they... So the, these, these, uh, so how should I say this? These interventions, the colonial interventions were not random. We know that. Okay. But the question is, can you find something that determined the nature of these interventions that doesn't influence economic growth today? If you can do that, okay. If you can find that thing that determines the nature of the political interventions, um, that doesn't affect dynamic growth today, maybe you can then infer the effect of those differences in political interventions, right? Because these colonial governments, um, they had, they weren't all the same. I mean, they had different 
rules, okay? And essentially, some of them were more kind of extractive, okay? They were just like, we're going to get in, get these resources, and get out, okay? Whereas others um, were relatively less extractive. They had more kind of rule of law, like you as a person may have certain rights here, okay? Now, obviously, that's not going to be even close to perfect or, or appropriate by modern standards, but um, there were variations in this, is all I'm saying, okay? Um, now, now, so so then what do they do? Well, what they do is they use settler mortality as an instrument, okay? So they use, now, the thing is with these colonies, when people would go to the colonies, so here we're thinking, think about like um, Jamaica would be an example of a colony of, of England um, and, uh, you know, sort of Hong Kong would be another example. Uh, India, you know, a bunch, I mean, like Malacca, all, um, you know, Jakarta, all these different places. Um, a lot of the English, they were pretty big on this stuff, uh, but other countries as well, okay? Um, like the Dutch uh, and things like that. So if, if you look at, and the French, if you look at this um, dynamic, generally though, uh, people coming from Europe didn't have, a lot of uh, gen like sort of um, acquired immunity, uh, I guess it would be genetic or, or potentially non-genetic, acquired immunity to diseases, tropical diseases. Okay, so tropical diseases are, are fairly deadly regardless what the situation is, but um, having immunity can help in, in for certain diseases. Okay, so, um, but yeah, so the settlers coming from Europe did not generally have great immunity, okay, and they would die like a lot. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, the numbers are, if you look at the numbers, it's pretty shocking. Actually, the, the fraction of people that would go and just kind of perish from disease. Okay, that was true generally at the time, but it was even more true for, for settlers. Okay, so, um, so you can look at uh, differences in that. Okay, you look at, I think, I think Jamaica had a really high settlement mortality, if, if I recall correctly, whereas other countries had lower ones. Okay, so you look at variations in that. Okay, so especially if you go down to like, Argentina or something, um, tropical diseases aren't as much of a thing there, um, and there's probably lower cellular mortality. Okay, so um, if you look, if you look at this dynamic, then essentially the, the logic would be countries with high cellular mortality. That was more the extractive; they just go there and um, they, they their only goal is to to sort of set up a little station so they can extract resources. Okay, um, uh, whereas in other countries, maybe that's more like they go there and live there, and they, they set up institutions that are more kind of inclusive or expansive. Okay, so, um, and then the idea is that you look at these variations in institutions and see how they lead to economic growth in the future. Now, it's a little funny because it's like, well, the high side of mortality, probably not good for business, right? It, even, you know, even today, it means that disease is more of a problem there, and hence, um, uh, it just generally, it's, it's harder, you know, economic growth may not be as good because disease is bad. Um, and there's some truth to that. The, the one thing, though, is that, um, you know, settler, like, settler mortality, it's different from, from the mortality of someone who is, who grew up there and lives there. Okay, so, um, because of the different, the different types of diseases. Okay, so, so it's not as sort of problematic as you might think. Okay, um, uh, that that's one thing, okay. But so if so, if you buy this though, you know that this settler mentality influenced um, these institutions, okay. Uh, but the but the, the settler mortality back then didn't in, doesn't influence economic growth today, okay, or economic outcomes today. Then this would be this would be the argument for a valid instrument, okay. Um, so you can do that. Uh, so they they try and quantify this stuff, okay. So um. They look at the settler mortality, okay? Um, these are country codes, so it's, it's so USA start, you know, started as a colony. So USA, Gambia, I think, Ghana, uh, probably Mal Maldives or Malawi, I'm not sure which one, uh, Tanzania, and so on. Okay, so you see a lot of <clears throat> countries that were colonized at various points in time in their history. Uh, and then you can see the settler mortality, and you can see that the higher the settler mortality, uh, Sorry, the um, this is a very confusing graph. Uh, this says average expropriation risk. Okay, this is a 
a score assessing the quality of expropriation risk. So, so actually, these when it's lower, they have higher expor expropriation risk. So higher settler mortality means higher expropriation risk. It's insane, I know. But um, and then lower settler mortality means like better expropriation environment, which actually means lower expropriation risk. Okay, so um, at some point, well, I just I caught you can see probably I just took a screenshot of this graph from from another PDF, so I can't really change it. But yeah, so the, the essential idea though is that you get kind of what we would call worse political institution, more expropriation when you have higher uh, uh, settler mortality. Okay, and this is expropriation risk today, 1985 to 1995. Okay, um, all right. So then that's that first chain of settler mortality influences institutions back then. Those are persistent. They influence institutions today as measured by uh, expropriation risk. Okay, and then we want to know. Okay, what about the relation that that other the 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 x to y the thing we're interested in, which is expropriation risk and GDP per capita. Okay, so here you can see kind of the better expropriation environment, which actually means lower expropriation risk. Uh, you see higher GDP outcomes. Okay. Um, Okay, so, you know, I mean, there's some potential problems with this. Okay, and I'm sure you guys can probably pick up on this if, if you look at the countries here, here more, more in detail. Okay, one is, is the, the quantity of, of actual European immigration. So what uh, essentially, like, how many Europeans actually moved there? Not just the amount of, like, commerce that was going on in the institutions they set up, but how many Europeans moved there? That might be a factor for a variety of reasons. Okay, um, if only because it affected how these European countries interacted with those other countries in the future, right? They may have treated them differently based on their, say, uh, composition of, of people, right? So, um, so that that could be an issue because then it's like you know you have settler mortality, which we're saying influences property rights, past and present, which may influence economic growth, but also that's probably going to influence European immigration, which for a variety of reasons may influence economic growth okay and so maybe there's a confounding factor like if this was what your actual true causal graph looked like you couldn't really just read this off that previous graph we had and and say that that's that's the answer okay because there's all sorts of other stuff that are that are going to be confounding factors even if it's not the case that settler mortality doesn't directly influence economic growth okay so um yeah uh, that's just one example. I mean, there's, there's many things you can do. So, so this, I think, um, yeah, I mean, the, the basic story is that like this kind of made a big splash and it's kind of a cool idea. It's not necessarily perfect, but it gives you an idea of the, the sort of stuff that people can do here and what you need to do to argue, to make a valid argument. Okay. That's, that's the whole story there. All right. Um, yeah. Um, there's other types. Okay. So I'm more or less out of time. Uh, you know, there's controlling for things like geography. That's all. That's our more implementation details. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, and then the other, the other thing you can, there's other types of, of experiments or, or ways that you can determine causality. Okay. And the, 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 the only one I really want to talk about also is, is what's called this regression discontinuity. Okay. Or a discontinuity study. So you can look at like at the border between two different like counties in the U.S. that have different policies, like maybe you think you know they're, they're relatively close, okay, so they should have similar economic and geographic considerations. But then you have a border where there's two different policies, and you look on either side of those that border, you're kind of it's good because only one thing is changing, right? Like everything else should be kind of continuous geographically, but then you have this policy change across the border. Okay, so that's an example where you you, you can you can try and determine like causality and stuff like that. Okay, so that would be like or if you're looking at like a country, it's like, you know, if you compare A1 with B1, like geographically, they're probably similar, unless there's like a huge ravine or a river here, which you can exclude. Uh, A2 and B2 are probably similar. A3 and B3 are probably similar, but then there might be different policies on either side. And so either country or locality, state, whatever, um, you can, by looking on either side, you can also take care of some of these confounding factors because they should be similar on either side of the border. It's just that there's this policy difference. Okay, or institutional difference. Okay, um, yeah. So, 
Okay, so that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't, I don't have too much time to, I guess I'm out of time. I don't have time to talk about the more the, the more the details of a border discontinuity or regression discontinuity, but that's another approach, okay? So that's that's pretty much it um, for the for the class. It's the last class. Uh, thanks for thanks for showing up, guys. I appreciate it. Um, sorry, we had a global pandemic in the middle of the semester, uh, but I think we're adapting. Um, I don't know if we're going to be back physically next year. Well, I guess a lot of you are graduating, so that should be interesting. Okay, and I wish you the best of luck if you are or even if you're not graduating uh, in, in your lives, okay? And uh, you never need anything, recommendation letter, whatever, let me know, I'm happy to write one uh, for all y'all, okay? And uh, good luck with everything. And um, I'll release the, the, the questions and, and answers for a little review slash practice exam uh, tonight, okay? And so you can check that out. And then I'll see you all at the midterm. And then the final, I'll see you all at the final, the final exam, okay? All right. Have a good one. I'll I'll I'll, I'll be in, I'll be chatting here. Okay, so I'll, I'll just go to space mode, but I'll I'll be chatting here if you have any other questions. Okay.